Welcome to the Science of Success with your host, Matt Bonner. Welcome to the Science of Success. I'm your host, Matt Bodner. I'm an entrepreneur and investor in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm obsessed with the mindset of success and the psychology of performance. I've read hundreds of books, conducted countless hours of research and study, and I'm going to take you on a journey into the human mind and what makes peak performers tick with a focus on always having our discussions rooted in psychological research and scientific fact, not opinion. In this episode, we discuss lessons from 25 years of studying the evolution of human emotion, examine whether the Machiavellian concept of power still works, explore the surprising scientific data on how you can acquire power, and look closely at the foundation of enduring power from studies of military units on how to achieve and maintain power with Dr. Dacker Keltner. The science of success continues to grow with more than 625,000 downloads, listeners in over 100 countries hitting number one new and noteworthy and more. A lot of our listeners are curious about how to organize and remember everything. I get tons of listener emails and comments asking me, how do I keep track of all the incredible knowledge I get from reading hundreds of books, interviewing amazing experts, and listening to podcasts, and much more. Because of that, we've created an awesome resource for you, and you can get it completely free by texting the word SMARTER to the number 44222. It's a guide we created called How to Organize and Remember Everything. To get it, just text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R to the number 44222 or go to scienceofsuccess.co and put in your email. In our previous episode, we discussed one of the most interesting results ever found in the psychological research of education. Why pleasure maximization is a flawed model for human understanding, we went deep into a number of research examples, discussed the massive and counterintuitive difference between motivating top performers and bottom performers, and much more with Dr. Dan Ariely. If you want to understand the surprising truth that research reveals about what actually motivates you, listen to that episode. Today, we have another fascinating guest on the show, Dr. Dacker Keltner. Dacker is the founding director of the Greater Good Science Center, a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley. He's also the author of The Power Paradox, How We Gain and Lose Influence, and Born to Be Good, as well as the co-editor of The Compassion Instinct. Dacker, welcome to the Science of Success. It's great to be with you, Matt. Well, we're very excited to have you on here. So for listeners who who may not be familiar, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So I grew up raised by a mom who was a literature professor and a dad who was an artist in a sort of an alternative set of circumstances in the late 60s and 70s, and then went to undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara, studied sociology and psychology, and then Stanford for graduate school in social psychology. And then I think, you know, Relevant to my scholarship, I, for 25 years, I've been studying the evolution of human emotion and in particular emotions like compassion and awe and gratitude and laughter. And then, you know, relevant to the power paradox, I've really been, been interested in the nature of human hierarchies and how do we get power in different kinds of hierarchies? How do we keep our power? Why does power turn us into sociopaths so regularly as we see in the daily news? So, Those have been my two longstanding interests. And then, you know, I teach at UC Berkeley. I have a giant lab called the Berkeley Social Interaction Lab. And then I run the Greater Good Science Center, among other things. So to get started, tell us a little bit before we kind of delve into the power paradox, which I'm very curious about. Tell us about kind of the biological and evolutionary origins of human emotion. I've been teaching human emotion at Berkeley for 20 years, and there are podcasts that that your listeners can listen to from iTunes and the like. And there's this old idea in the philosophical literature that you see with people like David Hume and Charles Darwin and Rene Descartes, that emotions drive our thought patterns and our reasoning and, and the way that we act in the world. And philosophers like Martha Nussbaum have written about how emotions are kind of the core to the social fabric of human society. So the question, Matt, is like, how do you translate that broad thinking to laboratory science? And my work's really been inspired by Charles Darwin, who wrote a really influential book on human emotion in 1872, The Expression of Emotion in Man and Animals, where he really argued that, you know, in terms of the biological origins of emotion, emotions are these basic ways in which we see the world, we interact with others, and we build up human society. So just to take one example, you take an emotion like 
gratitude, right, which my lab has studied in terms of touch and, and social benefits, when we feel gratitude and we express this emotion to other people, it builds up trust and cooperation between non-kin, which in the evolutionary framework is a fundamental component to, to strong social community. So we make the case in a lot of different kinds of studies that emotions are biological. They have specific systems in your body that, that are enabled by emotion. They help us connect to others. And they, they really solve the most important problems of being part of human societies. And one of the most fascinating things about that concept is, is the idea that a lot of times people who don't really have kind of a deep understanding of, of evolution sort of hear the phrase survival of the fittest and yeah. think of, you know, the big, strong, violent kind of people winning out. But that's not always the case, right? Yeah, you know, thanks for asking that, Matt. We are in the process right now in the evolutionary literature of really witnessing, I think, what you might call a revolution, which is that 40 years ago, when people thought about evolution, when scientists used that framework to think about human behavior, it, it was really survival of the fittest, right? It was, you know, comp competition and who's stronger and who's more adversarial to get the advantage that really prevails in terms of gaining resources and reproductive opportunities. And really in the past 40 years, we've seen this emergence of really the survival of the kindest hypothesis, which is what I've called it in Born to be Good. And what we've seen is, you know, just to give you some illustrative findings, like little kids as early as 18 months will help strangers accomplish tasks. That's the work of Tomasello and Wernicke. Around the world, Joseph Henrik has shown people will share with strangers 40% of their resources when they don't have to share at all. My lab has shown that we have genes and parts of the old parts of the mammalian brain that help us feel compassion and take care of vulnerable individuals. So, you know, I think what we're seeing is survival of the fittest is really an outdated way of thinking about evolution. We're a very social species. We're a collaborative species, although obviously we do other things. And there are these emotions like compassion and gratitude and awe that help us fold into strong social networks and, and work well together. One of the other really fascinating kind of findings or, or, or things you talk about around emotion is a lot of times when people think about emotion, they, they view it as, you know, sort of this thing we need to get rid of, or we need to be <laughs> these logical, rational robots. But you also say that's not always kind of the correct way to think about it. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, you know, and this is such an old, I would even call it a bias in our thinking about emotions, Matt, you know, that we think of emotions as destructive and dysfunctional and, you know, and when we are really mad at our romantic partner or outraged at our family or ashamed at what we've done, we'd, we'd give anything to get rid of those emotions, right? But in fact, you know, that we've, again, we're starting to see a much different take on, on the functionality of human emotions in our social living, that emotions really guide thought processes in effective ways. So, you know, my research has shown, for example, that, you know, feelings of compassion help you see how connected you are to other people. Emotions guide social behaviors in really important ways. So there's a lot of research on gratitude, for example, that if I express gratitude to people who are in my group or who people I work with, I will actually form stronger social ties within social networks that benefit me downstream. So there are a lot of sort of shifts in how we think about emotions. They aren't the, the kind of dysfunctional parts of the human mind. They're really adaptive. Uh, and, you know, one of the ways that we can test this hypothesis is you can look at people who don't feel a lot of emotion, who suffer forms of brain damage, sort of harm parts of their frontal lobes that knock out the passions. And, and they really don't do well, you know, in getting along with other people. So I think there's a, a kind of a movement afoot to rethink what the emotions are. And, and that idea kind of combined with a sort of a corollary from the point you just made about the survival of the fittest, sort of getting into the concept of power. When many yeah. people think of power, they think of kind of this Machiavellian concept. Is, yeah. that, is that concept, does that still work or is that something that's outdated? Well... You know, I, I think it's so interesting. I think the, Machia the, the straightforward Machiavellian approach to power 
is really, as historians have written, and you know, let's remember Machiavelli wrote The Prince, published in 1532, during a period in Italy, which was a very violent time, one of the most violent periods in human history. And it was, you know, the politics were, they, you know, would make us blush today about how kind of horrifying they were. And the Machiavellian philosophy to power, which your listeners probably would intuitively grasp is use force, be feared, be deceptive, trick people, make them think that you're good natured when in fact you're going to screw them over, right? It's a force and fraud philosophy of power. And, and studies show, you know, if you're going to negotiate with a really nasty person, you got to have some Machiavellianism uh, with you. If you're having a one shot negotiation, it's probably good to be a little bit Machiavellian. But in general, we're seeing that, you know, in studies in organizations and in military units and in schools, Machiavellians tend to actually not be respected by people around them, not be trusted by people around them, actually not gain power, not feel like they're powerful. In organizations, they get paid less. So I think, you know, it's an interesting historical question about or observation that we're really moving away from this force and fraud approach to power, notwithstanding our current politics. And, and we're kind of moving more towards collaborative power, where we work together and empathize and, and collaborate to get things done. So this collaborative power, kind of how would you define sort of the modern day or the, this new evolution of the concept of power? You know, it's really interesting. People have been looking at the nature of work, right? And the nature of, and, and here I would, I was really influenced by Robert Wright, who's a terrific writer, his book, Non-Zero. I love uh, that book. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's just, it, it blew my mind, right? And Wright's argument is that both in our biological evolution and then in our social evolution, as we have become more complex societies from the Renaissance villages that Machiavelli was working in, We've become much more collaborative, right? For scientists or in innovators to get work done, they got to work with a lot of different kinds of people. When I go consult at Facebook or Google and I work with a team on a project, there are 10 people there. There are designers and engineers and data analysts and language specialists and product managers. They're all, they all have these different specializations to get stuff done. For you and I to disseminate some of these ideas, we have multiple talents, right, that we have to work together with to, to produce a podcast. So life is more collaborative, right? And we are a very collaborative species. And so what that means is both early in our evolution in hunter-gatherer societies, it was really the collaborators and the, the, who really gained respect and power, you know, the, the individual who knew how to get good fish or a good sort of food source or helped sort of unite teams to fend off predators. And then today, what we're starting to find is this collaborative approach to power, where you cooperate, you empower others, you empathize, you you build strong teams, actually yields gains in power for the individual. So I think it's this really, I, I wish I was a historian and would have written more broadly about how we're, we're becoming a collaborative world and power follows suit, but I think the data are there. So getting into the data a little bit, you, you know, sure. what does the science say? Again, it's one of the big things on this podcast. We like to kind of be data driven. What does the science yeah. say about how to acquire power? It's so funny, Matt, when, you know, I think a lot of people, maybe many of your listeners, like if you ask them, you know, all right, be honest, do you want to have power? They'd, they'd feel a little bit uneasy or queasy, right? Like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to grab power. And, and, and in a way that's because we think of power as Machiavellian. I really define power as your ability to advance the greater good, to alter the states of people around you and make them do good work. And I think that fits a lot of different social scientific definitions of power uh, that you could apply at the international level. So that begs the question of how we gain power. And this is where I was really surprised in writing The Power Paradox about how much we've learned to answer this question in the scientific literature. So we gain power, for example, by really listening carefully and, and really taking in the wisdom and thoughts of other people around you. You know, Abraham Lincoln in the historical accounts was this, a great practitioner of this art of just empathy, listening, hearing people well, gaining collective wisdom actually gains you power. 
Another way we gain power is, you know, to put it really simply by being kind and pro-social. In hunter-gatherer societies, there's a, a prize-winning essay from four, that summarizes who are the leaders in 48 hunter-gatherer societies living for 200,000 years in the conditions of our social evolution, that really in which our social structure started to take shape. And, and Christopher Bohm observes, it's really the person who's fair, impartial, humble, and kind, right? So studies are starting to show, for example, in the competitive altruism literature, that if I share, if I'm kind, if I express gratitude, for example, in the work of Mike Norton at Harvard, in social networks or organizations, people will respect me more. They'll get, give me status and I'll have power and influence. So I think in a way we're returning slowly with, with a lot of exceptions in the world to our evolutionary roots of power being founded in kindness and empathy and being fair and, and humble. You seem shocked. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's, I think it's a very counterintuitive finding. If, if anything comes to mind, I'd love to maybe hear one or two examples from the research kind of sure. about how that, how you came to that conclusion. Yeah. So let me give you a couple of examples, you know, and, and I think, you know, these are just scientific tidbits out there because I've been speaking in really broad terms. So, you know, what studies find, for example, is that if you're able to read other people's emotions well, and in the power paradox, this book, I present a couple of fun tests of like reading emotions from people's facial expressions or drawings of emotion. If I can empathize in that way, I actually rise in financial analysis firms, right? I gain more power. If I'm a school kid and I'm in seventh grade and I'm facing the Lord of the Flies politics of the playground and I know how to read people's emotions well, just detecting emotions in their facial expressions, once again, I gain social power. If I am working on a team, this is a recent study from MIT by Woolley and colleagues, I'm working on a team, we got to solve some hard problems. And I'm listening carefully and asking good questions, really simple practices. My team does better and I gain power, right? So these are all specific examples of how, you know, this counterintuitive notion that just being good to others actually gets me power. Here's a final example of Adam Grant and Francesca Gina. If I'm a manager and I am trying to get people to do things and I simply say, thank you right? I express gratitude. Those people are more productive and enhance my influence and power. So there are a lot of new findings that, that tell us, you know, that Machiavelli was wrong, that, that the pro-social tendencies are pathways to power. Is power something that's given or something that's taken? Well, you know, you, when you when you look back in history, you know, and you read the great historical accounts of power, you know, you look at how what what Hitler did, you know, as a canonical example, and he killed his rival and killed other rivals and usurped power and, and then built up his fascist state, by the way, which fell calamitously. And, you know, we, we have this vision or image that and, and this really comes in a way out of Machiavelli and that we grab power, you know, you know, and you think about House of Cards or Godfather's popular portrayal of this. Uh, that's an old notion. But I think that really in today's 21st century, where we are more interdependent, we are collaborating more, there are better means by which we scrutinize other people's behavior. I mean, nowadays, Matt, you know, almost everything I do is rated on, you know, in the internet by rate your professor and, you know, people commenting on what I've said. Or what, and, and this is true of most people. So what that means is that we've moved away from the power grab view of how we get power to the fact that power is really given to us uh, according to how well we advance other people's interests. And if, if power is given, what are some of the ways that you know, you know, where does something like enduring power come from? Yeah. Well, in a way, this is the most important question, right? And we, you know, there are studies that show that really can pinpoint, you know, and I wrote about this in a piece for the Harvard Business Review, you know, that there, there are just certain things that if you do them, you'll, you'll gain respect and power in social groups, right? If you speak out and you offer some interesting ideas and you ask great questions, you listen well, 
you know, you show that you're, you've got some pro-social tendencies that are good for the group, things we've been talking about, you'll get power. But I think, you know, the, I think in a way, the deeper question for us is what you just asked, which is, how do I keep my power and status and respect with my work colleagues or, you know, my community colleagues or if I'm a part of a politically active group? And I, how do I keep the respect in that group or with my family? Right. And what studies are showing is that what really matters in this realm is in a sense that you show uh, that you can not succumb to sort of indulgent self-interest and that you can stay committed to the group. Right. You do things that are continue to be good for the group. So studies of military units show, for example, it's really the individual who kind of continues to work on behalf of others, show respect to others, express gratitude, sacrifice, who really keeps power. Historical studies of U.S. presidents, where historians have rated who were the great presidents with enduring legacy, show it's really the individuals who had bold ideas like FDR or Abraham Lincoln, but who continued to practice empathy and building strong social ties rather than really serving their own narrow self-interest. So enduring power is really found in these, these virtues, if you will, these more pro-social tendencies. And the importance of focusing on empathy and, you know, uh, building strong social ties, that really ties into the title of the book, which is The Power Paradox. Tell us a little bit about that concept and why it's so hard to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this, this is, you know, <laughs> this is where the trouble begins is really once we feel powerful and, you know, so what we're starting to document in the lab is, you know, that if I'm, if I'm a really good practitioner of empathy and listening and engaging in other people like Abraham Lincoln was, I'll gain a lot of power, you know, and we've talked about that evidence and, you know, and then I was going out in the world and working in different organizational contexts and I would see this come to life. I worked with Pete Doctor at Pixar, it, you know, as a scientific consultant on the film Inside Out. And Pete literally makes movies that have made billions of dollars. And I and I watched his artistic style and how he was with teams. And he was he was almost like Abe Lincoln, you know, he was empathetic and curious with other people and always interested in what other people had to say about an artistic project. And in Pixar, people speak of Pete, you know, and he has had enduring power. In, in in really the terms that Christopher Obum wrote about in terms of the leaders of our hunter-gatherer societies. He's kind, he's humble, interested in others, he's really fair, he'll go to bat for the things he really believes in, but he had these qualities. And then I was doing this research about the abuses of power, and and what we find is is really evidence of this power paradox. We get power by being good to other people. But then the seductions of feeling powerful, right? It, it almost feels like a drug rush or a mania, you know, that you just feel omnipotent. It gets you into trouble. So we found, Matt, you know, and this is probably, you could probably think of a million good examples of this, that, you know, if I get a little power, bit of power in an experiment and I'm working with two other people and I have power, I'll eat more of the food we're supposed to share, chocolate chip cookies, and I'll eat with my mouth open and lip smacking and cookie crumbs falling all over my sweater, right? I become like impulsive. We did this well-known study that got a big buzz that when drivers of cars approach a pedestrian zone and we put a young undergraduate at the edge of the pedestrian zone and he looked like he wanted to walk across it, you're supposed to stop drivers of poor cars, right? The AMC Pacers and so forth, always stop drivers of powerful fancy cars, Mercedes and BMWs, blaze through the pedestrian zone 46 percent of the time so we started to show you know and this is a this has been shown in dozens of labs a little bit of power of promotion success making a lot of money suddenly i'm swearing at people i'm greedy i'm engaging in sexually inappropriate behavior and that's the paradox of power is we get it by being good and then it unleashes what is bad and you touched on this a little bit, talking about some of the foundations of enduring power, but you know, yeah. what, what are some of the things we can do to kind of prevent a sort of a slip into the dark side? 
you know, I think people, and I bet your audience, Matt, is is very familiar with this. You know, when they think about their work lives or the communities they're in, they'll they'll, they'll start to realize, yeah, you know, it's it's that individual who has that spark that brings out the good in others, that lifts people up, that brings in value to the group, that gets power, and that's part of what we talked about. And my goodness, there's no shortage of evidence of how we abuse power, right? From people in churches to Anthony Weiner, regrettably named, and, and on. You know, it's just everywhere. So what do we do? How do we avoid this trap? And, you know, I think, I think the scientific evidence suggests a couple of things. One is just be aware of your power, right? And we often underestimate our power. We often fail to realize that once we're in a position of management, other people will look at us differently. They'll feel worried about our judgment of them. They'll, they'll, they'll sense the power dynamic. And we have to remember our, our sense of power in different contexts, right? When I work with my students, I make sure in each interaction that I'm mindful of the fact that they're probably a little worried about my authority and so forth. And so I shift my behavior accordingly. I, I take a more modest approach, a more humble approach. You know, I think a second thing I, you know, I think one of the most important things after just being aware of this state, right? And by the way, you got to be aware of these surges of feeling powerful, like everything's going really well, you feel invincible. That's when you're at your most vulnerable. A second thing that I think is really important is to really in, in each interaction, you know, at work or at home, it's really, you know, begin by focusing on other people. Really think about where they're coming from, what's on their mind, you know, what's what's their past been like. And that really is the foundation of empathy and the pro-social tendencies like gratitude that that really are a basis of enduring power. And when I'm around people who really inspire others in leadership positions, that quality really strikes me, right? That they're they're really interested in other people. They're curious. They remember what's been happening in their personal lives. They they know where they want to go in their the future in their work life. So really make it a practice of just remembering where other people are at in your interactions. You've worked with some amazing companies, Google, Facebook, etc. How can some of these lessons potentially be applied uh, to organizational dynamics? Being out here in Berkeley, you know, I've had this privilege in studying human emotion and this kind of and power. You know, I've gotten calls from Google and Twitter and Facebook and worked at Facebook and these really complex projects for four and a half years on their protecting care team and over at Pixar. And, and it really, this literature, when I teach this to leaders in different sectors, which I've done for 20 years, they know it right away, right? They know how Machiavellian leaders really bring units down and they know how the abuses of power at Enron or in you know, branches of government or the military units really undermine the functioning of teams and organizations. So, you know, it really begs this question, like, what do we do? And, and I think that one of the things that we do is we remind leaders that leadership has privileges and responsibilities and a set of ethics that really accompany it. And, and you see this interest in empathy and respect and cultivating trust and the like it in and thinking about leadership right and so that's one thing that's really important is just to there was an older school of thought that leadership and in a way it's machiavellian leadership doesn't need ethics just get things done whatever it takes and i think we're moving slowly away from that way of thinking i think a, a second thing you know the lot of people are interested in is how do you create cultures or social systems that avoid the abuses of power, right? How do you create a, an organizational unit that doesn't have a leader who's pushing people around with this Machiavellian approach? And I think there are things we can do. I think you, you know, and I hear about this a lot from in my teaching of leaders, you can, you can really work on a culture of respect, really, and make it very prominent that we, we really need to speak civilly, we can't swear at people, we need to be considered in our language. What we know scientifically is when there is really clear scrutiny and oversight and accountability of people in positions of leadership, right? 
where their actions are commented upon by their teams, where they're reviewed, where their others are aware of them, you see fewer abuses of power. So the, what I always emphasize is, you know, let's take the responsibility of ethical leadership if we are lucky to have that position. And let's think hard about our culture in ways that prevent the abuses of power. For somebody listening, how could they work on cultivating some of this kind of social intelligence yeah. that underpins not only sort of healthy societies, but also maybe the acquisition of good power? Yeah. And I know, I mean, I, and I hope I haven't sounded too abstract or scientific or, you know, but Matt, that is the, the real serious question in all of this. And, and what I would recommend is, first of all, you know, I just wrote this piece at the Harvard Business Review on how to have and enjoy enduring power through the things that we've been talking about, Matt, like, you know, listening really effectively, asking great questions, knowing how to express gratitude in a heartfelt, sort of thoughtful way, how to be aware of power and powerlessness, how to practice kindness in different places. So I think that article, which did really well, just offers a series of practical things to do. And I do that a bit in The Power Paradox, this book as well. And then the second thing that I'd really encourage your large audience to do is to go to the Greater Good Science Center, and that's greatergood.berkeley.edu. We've been working away at this for 15 years. And what it is, is we distill all of these ideas that are all tested by science, and we distill it down into really straightforward practices that you can engage in, right? So if you want to handle a really stressful boss better, there are mindfulness practices and breathing practices that help you kind of calm your stress response. If you want to sort of express gratitude in a really powerful literary way at the Greater Good Science Center, all for free, we write about how to say thank you. If, you, if you're in a really difficult conflict, right, and it could undermine your power and your influence and the quality of your bonds, we have a lot of tools for showing forgiveness and saying you're sorry. So at that site, there are tons of practical recommendations that are really the foundation of, of this new model of collaborative and enduring power. They're all free. So. Uh, perfect. Well, we'll make sure to include both of those in the show notes okay. so that anybody listening can, yeah. can get those. Tell us a little bit more. You, you kind of touched on it. What is the Greater Good Science Center and what led you to create that? Yeah. Thanks, Matt. You know, 15 years ago, and this was right in the wake of the terrorist attacks, 9-11. In a sense, as we are today, we were, we were jangled as a culture back then. And we were like, what's the world coming to? And well, who are we? And how do we respond to this, this new world of threat and so forth? And it, are we heading towards the apocalypse? And some donors, the Hornadays, who are alumni of UC Berkeley, um, coming out of their own personal tragedy of losing a daughter early in life at age 26, reached out to me and they said, you know, we want to build something that makes as many people cooperative, kind, and peaceful as humanly possible. And this was, you know, really before online magazines and podcasts and the like. And what we decided to do, and we hired somebody named Jason Marsh coming out of a journalism school, is we decided to take this new science we've been talking about of cooperation, collaboration, and gratitude, and compassion and empathy and the like, and translate that science to essays that people can read, like medical doctors or lawyers or school teachers, more recently with greater good in action, sort of give people practices, you know, what can I do for in a couple of minutes that makes me more empathetic? And those are listed at ggia.berkeley.edu. And then over the past 15 years, we've you know, we've been lucky to be able to give that away, to give away this new science, give away its major discoveries, write about it in really appealing ways that appeal to our 5 million readers. And now, sort of now that science is starting to test these practices, to sort of give away specific recommendations for cultivating gratitude or empathy or kindness. And that's our mission. And it's, it's had a lot of influence in the educational realm and medical realm organizational work, and we hope it continues to grow. Well, I think it's a credible mission and a great resource. So I'm very excited for listeners to check it out. So am I. Thank you. 
Changing gears a little bit, I'd love to hear about your experience consulting on the film Inside Out. It was mind blowing. So about six years ago, I had I had known the director Pete Doctor, who did the movie Up. Did you get to see Up? I have not seen Up actually. You, you have to see it. It's it's got one of the best portrayals of love that you'll ever see. So I had known Pete professionally. We'd been on some panels together eight ten years ago. And, you know, Pixar is over in Emeryville, which is next door neighbors to Berkeley. And, and one day he called me six years ago and he said, hey, you know, hey, Dacro, this is Pete. And I was like, hey, Pete, you know, he's like thinking about doing a movie about human emotion. And I was like, well, that's a great idea. And I'd been teaching emotion for 20 years and he said, and I, what I want to portray is how emotions, and we talked about this earlier, they guide our thought processes and our memories and how we perceive the world in front of us. And then at the same time, as they shape inside our heads, emotions through our expressions and our tone of voice and our body language shape the outside world, how we interact with others, the inside out notion. And I was like, Pete, you know, that's the entire thesis of the science of emotion is they guide interior life and exterior life. And he said, and I want to do it in an 11 year old girl as she's going through a really hard time in life. And I was like, oh my God, you know? So what happened is about every six months or a year from the beginning of the development of this film where Pete was just working with his collaborator, Ronnie Del Carmen, kind of sketching out the characters and the ideas until the very end when they're really working with their teams of, a lab, of animators and computer specialists and the like, you know, I'd pop in and, and, and I would talk about the science of emotion. Sometimes they'd ask me questions like, you know, tell us about what happens to emotions when they stop. Like, where do they go? Or what happens if to emotional memories? Why do we forget so many emotional parts of our lives? Or are there things that happen to us early in life, core memories with friends or with our parents or maybe getting bullied at school or what have you that shape our mind for the rest of life? So I would visit. Just talk about science, answer questions over email. And then, you know, about a, six months before the film was released, they brought me in to see a, a screening and I literally started crying. I mean, I was blown away at how much depth that film captured in portraying the science and then what emotions do for the human psyche. It's an incredibly powerful film and one that yeah. many, yeah. many people, uh, you, it resonates really deeply with them. Yeah. And the, and the science behind it is very, you know, totally valid and, and was kind of what you consulted on and helped really bring to life. Yeah. You know, so they would ask me questions like, do early emotional experiences like in Riley's character, you know, these, these early images, the core memories with her friend or playing hockey or ice skating with her family. Do they shape what our lives are like later? And yes, they do. The scientific literature suggests it's the case. Here's a really relevant scientific literature. They asked me, you know, we, we've got this idea. And Pete had a daughter that really inspired the movie. I had daughters that were making me wonder about what they were going to sort of portray in the movie at the same age. What happens to young girls when, when they head into the teen years, as Riley is in the movie? What happens to their emotional lives? And I went to the scientific literature you know, I don't know if you have kids or not yet, Matt, but, you know, when girls hit 12, 13, they're a 10 year old girl is a really happy person, thriving and joyful. And then as they drop down, as they hit the teen years, they kind of the worry and anxiety and self-consciousness hits and they really drop in their emotion, their positive emotions precipitously. And, and the film really portrayed that, right? The emotional angst of the early teen years. They ask questions like, are people defined by core emotional tendencies or traits, right? And we had done studies and we've looked at like, who are the really compassionate people or the awe prone people or the I've done work on really angry kids or fearful kids. And it, there is a lot of data that suggests that who we are and our identities and how we think of ourselves is shaped by our temperamental tendencies towards specific emotions. And that led to the thinking in the film of joy being this defining emotion of Riley. I was blown away how seriously they took the science. One, in one moment, Pete, doctor, 
he was in Russia promoting the film and he was going to have a conversation with a, a Russian neuroscientist <laughs> with this giant audience in Russia. And he emailed me at one in the morning and he's like, tell me everything you know about dopamine and oxytocin and serotonin and cortisol, these neurochemicals that are involved in emotion. And so I, I sent him chapters from my textbook and scientific papers. So they, they really were grounded in the science, but then they took their liberties too. So for someone that, let's say, is, is sort of predominantly defined by an emotion like fear, anxiety, is that something yeah. that is kind of their destiny or is that something that's changeable? That is not only one of the oldest questions that we ask about human nature, which is, you know, we are born with certain genetically based tendencies. So how do we shift them? That not only relates to amazing new literature is called epigenetics, which is we have these genetically based tendencies, but experience your life with your family, where you're born in a civil war, or you're born in an area of poverty where you don't get parks and, you know, opportunities to, to play actually shapes the expression of genes. But that question is also personally relevant, which is, you know, I have a lot of anxious tendencies in my mom's side and have had a lot of periods of my life where People would say I uh, have anxiety tendencies, and that is part of who we are. I think the evidence from genetic studies and identical twins and studies of rodents where you alter their genetic structure tells us it's probably 40% of who we are. But a big part of who we are, Matt, is, is what we do with it, right? One of my motivations with the Greater Good Science Center is having experienced firsthand how volunteering I work in the prisons and volunteer kind of makes me feel stronger than my anxious tendencies. And I've learned firsthand that if I practice a little mindful breathing each day, I'm physically calmer. And I've learned firsthand if I go backpacking or get out in nature, I feel stronger. And so what we promote at the Greater Good Science Center is a practical answer to your question, which is you may be born with a anxious genetic profile, but there is an enormous amount to do that brings you peace and contentment and wisdom in the face of that tendency and, and the data back it up. So this is kind of a, a non sequitur question, but one of the pieces of research you've done that I found fascinating was about how uh, we can communicate emotions just with touch. I'd love to <laughs> kind of share some of that research and, and tell that story really briefly. Thank you. Thanks for asking that because, you know, the scientific literature has, 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 you know, kind of looked at this research like, wow, that's weird. Uh, you know, so, so I've studied human emotion for 25 years since I worked with Paul Ekman and it got me to inside out. You know, I studied the face and voice and body and gesture and eye contact and the like. And one of the things that scientists had not studied is touch, right? How we, you know, when you pat somebody on the back or you give them a hug or you fist bump or chest bump or what, what have you, what can we communicate with brief patterns of touch? We know touch is massively important in human social life. It's, it's really the first bond or the first medium by which babies connect to their parents, right? It's through touch and voice. And we know big parts of your brain process information about touch. So what we did in our first study with Matt Hertenstein at UC Berkeley is we brought people to the lab. One person comes to the lab, we hand them a list of emotions, right? Written on a piece of paper, gratitude, anger, compassion, love, sadness, sympathy. And then another person arrives and they stick their arm through this big barrier that we built in the lab. And that first person now has to touch that arm for half a second to communicate all these different emotions, right? If I'm the second person, I get touched on the arm and I have to guess what emotion that person was trying to communicate. And what we find absolutely astounded me, which is whereas chance guessing would be, you know, anywhere between eight and 12%, depending on the study, people can communicate compassion, gratitude, love, sympathy, anger, disgust, fear, sadness at, at seven or eight times the level of chance guessing 60, 70% of the time they get it right. And so what that tells us, you know, Matt is we have this amazing language of touch by which we, we can say we're sorry to somebody. We can express thanks. We can express affection. We can show frustration just with these very brief 
incidental patterns of touch. And one of my favorite findings from that was some of the gender differences in the research. <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't ask me about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, my student Matt came to me and he's like, you know, Dak, we got this great paper taking shape, but I need to tell you about these gender differences. I was like, what? He's like, well, when the woman tries to communicate anger to the male arm, he has no idea what she's doing. I was like, ah, that's terrible, you know. And secondly, when the man tries to communicate compassion to the female, she she can't really tell what he's trying he's doing. He, she gets very few right. And we replicated that, you know, and I think this is just a classic heterosexual gender story, which is, you know, men have a little bit of trouble conveying sympathy and women struggle a bit more in, in showing anger that a male can perceive. So it's a very telling set of findings that speaks volumes to our intimate lives. So what is one piece of homework that you would give somebody listening to this episode? So first I go to the greater good science center. And if your listeners, Matt, are interested in this stuff, they're interested in the science of inside out or good power, or how do you handle stress or how do you cultivate gratitude or awe? Just go there. And we have built it up over 15 years in a way that is tailored to each individual and what they're really interested in building. I think the thing that doing the science and writing these books and just teaching this stuff for 25 years has really taught me, and in a way it goes back to what you said, which is let's move out of this cynical view of human beings, survival of the fittest, and let's look at people in a new light. And it's really hard today in this political climate, for example. But I think the, the piece of homework that I feel this work points to is for your listeners to really study people carefully and take delight in how good people can be and then figure out ways to make societies do a better job of cultivating those tendencies and, and bringing those things into your life more. And, you know, these are old ideas you find in the great ethical traditions. And, and if we return to them today, you, you'll do okay. And you touched on this already, uh, but where can people find you online one more time? There are several things to do to find me online. Greatergood.berkeley.edu, ggia.berkeley.edu. You can Google the Berkeley Social Interaction Lab for our scientific papers. And then if you really want to dig deep, you can take edX's free class, The Science of Happiness. So if you Google edX, Science of Happiness, We've had over 400,000 people enroll for the class, and it covers a lot of what we're talking about today. Well, we'll include all of those links in the show notes as well for everybody listening, so you'll be able to access all these amazing resources. Well, Docker, thank you so much for being on the Science of Success. This has been a fascinating conversation. I've learned a tremendous amount, and I know that listeners are really going to get a lot out of this. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciated your questions. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. Listeners like you are why we do this podcast. The emails and stories we receive from listeners around the globe bring us joy and fuel our mission to unleash human potential. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at scienceofsuccess.co. That's M-A-T-T -T at scienceofsuccess.co. I would love to hear from you and I read and respond to every single listener email. The greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes. That helps more and more people discover the science of success. I get a ton of listeners asking me, Matt, how do you organize and remember all this information? Because of that, we created an amazing free guide for all of our listeners. You can get it by texting the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, -E to the number 44222, or by going to scienceofsuccess.co, that's scienceofsuccess.co, and joining our email list. If you want to get all the incredible information, links, transcripts, everything we just talked about, and much more, you can get all of our show notes at scienceofsuccess.co. Just go to scienceofsuccess.co and hit the show notes button at the top. You will get the show notes for everything, links, articles, all the important stuff that we talked about, and episode transcripts. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Science of Success. Music